the best troubleshooters are CCIE level troubleshooters because not only do you learn about new features and new protocols at the CCIE level, but existing stuff that you start at the CCNA, then you progress to the CCNP, now you're learning so much more depth about those things. Do you know what it takes to build a successful career in the networking field? Is it as simple as just going out and getting a few networking certifications? Or is there more to it? Well, today's guest is gonna tell you everything you need to know to start and advance your career in the networking field. He started his career out uh, working for Cisco in their technical assistance center, and through years of developing and his skills, is now an instructor for INE teaching Cisco certifications. Without any further ado, please welcome Keith Bogart to the show. Thanks for having me on your, your program, Dakota. So I am Keith Bogart. I've been uh, an instructor here at INE for, I don't know, eight, nine years, something like that. Uh, my specialties while I've been here is teaching the CCNA and CCNP level stuff, specifically with regards to what used to be called routing and switching is now called Enterprise by Cisco. I have a CCIE that I got way back in 1999, so I have also created some CCIE level videos and courses, but that's what I do at INE. I, I record video courses, I create quizzes, I create labs to supplement those courses. Every once in a while, I do live, like virtual training boot camp type stuff. And before that, I worked at Cisco for about uh, 18 years uh, in the TAC as a network consulting engineer. And then the last sort of 12 years of my career there were doing kind of what I'm doing now as an as a instructor for their own internal engineers. That's pretty cool. And I actually want to talk about your, your experience working in TAC in a little bit, but I want to talk about, so a lot of people that are interested in getting into the IT field in general or specifically networking, the CCNA is like their golden ticket. Like it feels like the entryway into the networking field. A lot of people wonder, can you just jump straight into the CCNA or what kind of prerequisites do you need to know before you can start studying? You're right. The CCNA is sort of like the, the de facto standard as far as certifications for entry level into networking. There are others. I mean, Juniper has theirs. CompTIA has like the Network Plus or something. But CCNA is more widely known in the industry. And it's also tougher because it covers a much broader scope of concepts than, than any other entry level exam that I know of. Now, yes, to answer your question shortly, one can jump right into that without any previous knowledge. Um, one thing I will recommend, though, is that when you start studying for your CCNA, whatever it is, whether you know be INE stuff, hopefully, uh, or you know the official certification guidebooks or whatever, my personal recommendation is use a broad range of training things. Um, someone who jumps right into it, sometimes they'll find just within the first chapter that there's some acronyms and stuff they're throwing out that weren't even defined before the first chapter. Hopefully that won't happen, uh, but you know every author makes some assumptions, right? If you find that while you're studying right off the bat, just pause whatever you're using and Google you know, what term or phrase you're getting stuck on. Uh, absolutely, and did I just hear that INE actually just redid their course material for the CCNA? Actually, it's kind of funny and good for me since I teach CCNA is when Cisco what, about six, eight months ago, something like that, came out with their version 1.1 of all their exams, the CCNA was one that they left untouched. So they didn't change the CCNA. Uh, so there wasn't really any need for us to change it. However, we do perform updates. Like, for example, I will periodically create new labs and add labs to existing courses within our CCNA learning path. You know, certainly if a customer finds an error in something, which does happen occasionally, I get right on that and I make updates to the videos or, or whatever is necessary for that. So that exists. Absolutely. Now, when I was studying for the CCNA, which was quite a while ago, back in the day when pretty much NetAcad was your only option to study. And um, this was actually back in high school. One of the most useful resources I found was to actually practice what I was learning to actually build like a lab and stuff. And I think the concept of having a lab, I used to say you need to go out and buy some used equipment. And um, I still kind of feel that's one of the great ways to do it because you're actually plugging in cables and stuff. But nowadays, uh, virtualization in like for labbing has become come along so far. And do you feel like having a virtual lab is enough to study for the CCNA now? It really begs a question, which is, what is someone's ultimate objective? Is their objective just to 
pass the exam, which unfortunately is the objective of many people out there. They just want to learn the absolute minimum necessary to get that four letter acronym after their name on business cards, right? Unfortunately. Or is the objective to actually learn yeah. CCNA level stuff so that you can actually do it when you get a job? Because I would imagine the worst feeling in the world would be to sort of get yourself into a job convincing somebody you're a CCNA. And the first day they realize you're you're full of smoke because you can't do anything. So you got a bunch of head knowledge and you can't do anything. <laughs> I think we'd all want to avoid that. So uh, the short answer is if your only objective is to pass the exam, because there's a lot of people out there who that's their objective, then absolutely. Um, a network simulator, some sort of virtualization of networking is fine uh, to pass the exam. Absolutely. But if you really want to be a CCNA level engineer and be able to start on the job with some basic things like, cabling equipment, connecting to the console of something, resetting a router switch back to factory defaults with the mode button, things like that. You can't simulate that in a virtual environment and you need some minimal set of hardware to do that. My wife, I see, I, she rolls her eyes every time I bring in a new piece of networking equipment to my lab, but uh, you don't need to spend a lot of money to build yourself a home lab to get started. I bought three routers and two switches off of eBay for like a hundred bucks. And that's, I feel like is more than, that's actually really more than you need, I think, for when you're just starting out at the CCNA level. My question is, and I've heard this a lot, and you know, I, I've never progressed past the CCNA. When you go into that next level, that CCMP certifications, is having a, a physical lab still practical um, or does the cost start going up with the more advanced technologies? Well, the challenge with the more advanced technologies is that they're going to be testing you on things that might be cost prohibitive for you to actually buy yourself. For example, um, maybe at, you know at the CCMP level, they might ask you a handful of questions on something called DNA Center. And they might not even expect you to know necessarily how to configure it, but they might say, here's a screenshot. You know, what, what within the screenshot would you press or click on to make this happen? Well, DNA Center, last I heard, was like a minimum of $80,000 or something to buy <laughs> that, that server that hosts DNA yeah. Center. Nobody's going to do that, right? So there are things like that. Uh, maybe a wireless LAN controller that, you know, what would you use that for after you're done preparing for your cert? Things like that that can cost thousands of dollars. So in, in that situation, when you get to the higher levels, you're going to have to use either somebody else's lab because there are labs out there that can offer like DNA Center that you can get for five days for a few hundred bucks because that's an expensive platform or virtualization of some things. For example, some of the other things like ICE, the Identity Services Engine, that's something that you can do virtually without actually buying the application necessarily and running it on your own server in your house somewhere. One thing I kind of get asked a lot of times is after my CCNA, what should I do next? Should I just dive right into a CCMP or, you know, what is the next, you know, logical progression after CCNA? Career-wise, that is. I've heard that one a lot, too. So you definitely don't want to stop with your CCNA. There are so many people out there uh, with CCNAs that you're just going to be another name on a list of potential resume candidates if that's all you've got. So you want to definitely go beyond that. Um, so, you know, if you don't have the actual experience to go along with the CCNA, now, if you say, I've got CCNA plus, you know, five years volunteering in the library's network or something like that, well, that, that adds a lot to it. But a lot of people don't have that especially if they go from being, you know, a grocery store clerk to wanting to work as a network admin or something. So, yes, you will want to go on to the next thing. Uh, the next thing would logically be the CCNP. Now, the CCNP starts to break off, right? So there's just one CCNA, but the CCNP level, there's different sort of specialties. There's service provider, collaboration, enterprise. So what I always recommend to people is you get your CCNP enterprise first, because the enterprise has a lot of concepts that you'll find in these other specialties too. Uh, you know, maybe you want to go into wireless or security or collaboration. You'll find that there's a lot of stuff in those that you'll also find in enterprise. So I would definitely recommend that people at an absolute minimum, once you get your CCNA, pass your CCNP Encore exam. In order to get your CCNP, you have to pass two exams, a concentration and a core so Encore stands for Enterprise Core. So even if you don't get your full CCNP by doing both your concentration and your core exam, at least get that core exam. And I think they, 
for every exam you pass, they give you something like a specialization certification or, or something like that. So you get some sort of, you know, accolades that you pass their exam. So at a minimum, get your CCNA and your Encore um, and then start looking for work. But ideally, you pass both CCNP exams and get your full-fledged CCNP. Now, I want to take a step back here. You kind of mentioned for, uh, about someone trying to transition into networking. Do you think it's possible for someone to go from like zero experience um, in the networking field to being able to land like an entry level networking position? Or is there like a career progression you think that needs to happen? Like, does someone need to have some experience at like help desk before they can get into that networking position? I, I absolutely do think it's possible. Um, it's just based on your own drive and initiative, really. You know, someone who's working, like in my example, you know, as a grocery store clerk or working at the library, or working at the DMV or something, they can certainly study for and pass the CCNA on their spare time. You know, it'll take several months to do that, but they can. And then once they get their CCNA, my typical recommendation at that point is, you know, don't start applying for jobs at that point because they're not going to probably look at you. Um, at that point, what I'd recommend is do two things. Uh, number one, like I said, pursue that Encore exam, start studying for that and labbing for that and, and trying to get that. And then secondarily, try to find some place that you can volunteer working in their network department or shadowing somebody. Um, you know, everybody wants to feel important. Everybody wants to feel like they can contribute. So if you walked up to, like in my example, the library or, uh, you know, some small company, some small business or something that has a network. And you said, hey, um, you know, I, I'm Joe, you know, can I talk to your network manager, your network engineer who works here? If you got to hold that person and say, look, is there any way I could shadow you for like maybe an hour in the evenings or a couple hours on the weekends or something? Don't expect to get paid. I just want to learn networking and I just want to learn from you. Um, you know, as long as they don't feel like you're going to slow them down in what they're doing, if you just come across as being authentic, genuine, you really want to learn, you really want to apply yourself. I think a lot of people would say, sure, I mean, a, a few hours a week isn't going to hurt me to, to have you shadow me and, and do that. And that way you can actually gain some experience while you're pursuing your Encore exam as well. So I would recommend that sort of multi-pronged approach. No, that, that's such great advice. I think that also helps kind of build some experience. I find a lot of times people that already are working in the field tend to be quite approachable and um, especially if you're interested in becoming like a networking engineer and you go up to someone and it's like, Hey, I really am interested in what you do for a living. Can you like, tell me more? Can you kind of mentor me? You'll find a lot of times people in this field are like more than happy to, to help someone else out. Absolutely. I think that's a real, real, um, advantage to have. Absolutely. And just one other thing I would add to that is if someone fought, can't do that, like for whatever reason, they, they can't find someone willing to do that. Maybe another approach would be, all right, now this is going to cost you a little bit of money, but try to build your own network from scratch at home. And I'm not just talking about, you know, a router and switch. I'm talking about, you know, when you think about a network, what is a network used for? People use it to exchange emails, right? They use it to do instant messaging. They use it to store files and download those files, maybe to do some voice and video across that network. Try to build in your home a network that does all that stuff. Um, get familiarized with, you know, the Linux operating system and, and various servers and what applications you can have on there. Put in a pup cup, you know, attach your laptop via wireless or wi you know, wired to that network and build something out so that in your resume, you can actually say, I built a network composed of this that can do all of these things that has this security built into it. So even if you didn't work in somebody else's network, the fact that you built something like that yourself, I think would go a long way as well. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was applying for my very first job in the IT field, that's one thing that got brought up during my interview is that I had a home lab and I started talking about some of the things I did. It really piqued the hiring manager's interest. You know, I went from just someone who knew how to study to someone who is actually already physically doing some of the things that they were looking for. So that can be a huge leg up to anyone who's trying to get into the field. Now, a lot of people are coming to me now these days that are um, concerned about, you know, the ev evolution of the IT field and networking in particularly between cloud and AI. There's been a lot of advancement in the tech field. What do you think the impact of cloud and um, AI is going to have on networking in particular? Are we going to see a 
diminishing, you know, you know, less jobs in the networking field as things migrate, or is there always going to be the need for that networking engineer? So the way I see it is that you have sort of at a real high level, three general categories of networks. You've got the really small networks, you know, maybe you've got like, you know, the network at Starbucks, for example, which might be one router, one switch and a couple of access points. You've got medium sized networks, you know, like the, the office of I and E in, in North Carolina, um, it's, I would consider that a medium sized network. We've got a, a couple of routers. We've probably got about 40 access points, a couple of switches and a firewall. And then you've got your really large enterprise campus federal networks, government networks. Now, it's at those really large levels and also, you know, your service providers, right? They have huge networks. It's at those really, really big networks that you're going to see the evolution of automation, AI, uh, more stuff put into the cloud, um, not so much at the small and medium size necessarily. So the first thing you have to think about is what's your goal? You know, is it your goal that you immediately want to jump into a giant network owned by General Electric or IBM or Cisco or something like that? Great if you do. Um, and those networks are going to have all that advanced technology and all those sort of moving parts. But it, in some ways, it might be easier, especially for an entry level job, to get a job in one of those smaller to mid-sized networks. As far as those are concerned, well, let's talk about the cloud for a second. So in order to access the cloud, you've got to have a network, right? At a minimum, you've got to have some sort of a router uh, to be able to connect to the internet, to get across the internet, to get to your cloud resources in AWS or Azure or whatever they are. So there's, there's always going to be some minimal on-premise network required. What's your laptop, your PC going to connect to? If you don't have any network at home, how are they going to connect to something? You're still going to have some sort of access point or something for that. So there's always going to be some on-premise network to get you to the cloud. And as far as AI is concerned, I don't know if we're ever going to get there, but certainly we're at the point right now. I mean, certainly when I use ChatGPT or Google Bard or something like that, what do you have to do? You have to double, double check its responses, right? Sometimes they'll give you responses that are not quite right, especially technical stuff. You know, provide a configuration for such and such, and you'll read through the configuration it gave you. <laughs> and it's like, wait a second, you're missing something here. This is off. And if you didn't know anything about networking, if you didn't know anything about configurations, you wouldn't even be able to look at its response and intelligently determine, is that right or is that wrong? So... I don't think that AI and cloud is going to completely take over the need for a network engineer. It's just going to, it's just another layer that's being added on to it. With cloud, you know, the network demand is not going away. It's just migrating and evolving. All those servers up in the cloud have to be connected to something. The network still exists. There's, exactly. there's still networking needed. Um, so absolutely. I, I think we're going to, there was a huge pu push to the cloud with COVID. But I think since then, things have kind of regressed back and we're gonna start seeing more of this hybrid infrastructure where you're still gonna have your on-prem network and your on-prem service, just things that are easier to keep on-premise. Um, so I don't think that needs ever gonna go away. It's definitely evolving. The, the job's not gonna look the same in the next five years as it does now. There's gonna be changes. And people who I, I feel that are gonna be successful in this field are gonna be ones that can adapt and learn to evolve with it. One thing I'm actually curious about is your take on the CCIE. You know, I know you have your CCIE. Is a CCIE mainly for people interested in like teaching networking or who should get a CCIE? If you are working now or will soon be working in one of those small to mid-sized networks, I don't think a CCIE is necessary. Uh, now, if you're going to be working in one of those really large networks that have, you know, hundreds or thousands of devices, switches, routers, access points, firewalls, so on and so forth, and a network like that that is becoming automated, uh, growing, uh, always introducing new features and stuff like that, then, then yes, the CCIE would be very valuable in working in that, not only in working in the network now as it stands, but once you get your CCIE, it sort of opens your mind up to, hey, there's there's all these other features and protocols that I learned about at the CCIE that aren't necessarily in place right now in this big network I'm working on, but might be. Maybe they'd be beneficial. A network engineer wants to progress 
in their job. You, you know, you're probably going to start out with what they call rack and stack, right? Where you're racking stuff and plugging in the cables and everything like that. But you certainly don't want to stay there for too long. It's you know, <laughs> hard on your shoulders and your back, if nothing else. So then you're probably going to progress to someone who is uh, doing some initial basic configuration, maybe some basic troubleshooting. But eventually, most people want to reach the point where your expertise in networking is relied on to make decisions about the direction that the network is going in, which means that you know about features and protocols and things that aren't currently in your network, but could be used to make your network more efficient and more productive. And it's at the CCI level that you really start learning about those things. Also from a troubleshooting perspective, um, the best troubleshooters are CCIE level troubleshooters because not only do you learn about new features and new protocols at the CCI level, but existing stuff that you start at the CCNA, then you progress to the CCNP. Now you're learning so much more depth about those things at the CCIE level, which makes you a much more efficient troubleshooter as well. So now you go from like your level three to your level four, you know, troubleshooting person. Uh, so I think it would help in that way. And obviously there's the, the pay component. Um, CCIEs, are typically paid a lot more than people who are CCNA or CCNP. So it, it will help you advance in your pay scale as well. That is so cool. It gets me excited about certifications and makes me want to go out and get recertified. I am a networking guy down at heart. I'm a director of network operations at my day job. And um, every morning I wake up and I, I'm so excited to get into the network and learn new things. And even at the level I'm at, um, I'm, I'm constantly learning every day. And I think that's really required for someone um, who is serious about building a long lasting career is this field is evolving faster than ever. And you have to constantly be learning and keeping up with the times. Uh, would you agree? I would. Yeah, I would. So Dakota, you mentioned that you were a, a director of networking at your own company. And I want to sort of ask you or reflect back to you the same type of question you asked me, which is that if someone came to you and they said, I want to work for you. I want to work as a network admin or network engineer in your department, on your network. All I've got is a CCNA. You know, how would you view that candidate and would you want or expect them to have anything above and beyond their CCNA? That's actually a really good question because we actually just hired someone that um, we were looking for like an entry level, like networking person to come in. And for this position, I specifically wanted someone that actually did not have a lot of experience. I wanted an entry level person. You know, to me, one of the most important skills is soft skills, the ability to kind of communicate with others. You know, I know I can teach those on the job skills. I can teach those important skills. If they have like that basic fundamental knowledge, the CCNA, to me, that's enough to get them started as long as they have that proper drive. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to that individual's drive and ambition. Um, and willingness to learn if they are super motivated like man i'm gonna i will do anything you want i will mop the floors in my spare time i just want to get my foot in the door mm -hmm. that's someone i know i can train as long as they can communicate and work well with others i think that's enough to get your foot in the door to an entry-level position now if i was looking for someone a little bit more advanced um like a higher end position um in our organization maybe a network engineer or a network admin that's where I'm going to start looking for more of those advanced skills. And we are a small organization I work for. We have like 35 employees total. So we kind of require everyone to be a jack of all trades. You know, um, a lot of the bigger organizations, you'll kind of get siloed off into one technology where you only focus in on this one thing. Um, and that's great because you become an expert in that one thing. But I think what you'll find a lot with these smaller organizations is you have to you have to have a really broad set of skills because you're going to be expected to do tons of different things. And for me, that's someone I look for because I also realized that person is probably really interested in how things work and they're driven to learn more. So does that answer your question there? Absolutely. And could I ask you a follow on question to that? Yeah. So in that type of environment you're talking about where it's going to be more of an expectation that you become more of a jack of all trades. And I get this question sometimes too is people will ask me, well, in addition to networking, you know, what I've learned on my CCNA, am I going to, to work in a company like Dakota's, am I also going to have to learn how to, for example, administer servers? Do I have to learn what Windows server or Linux servers are? Do I have to learn how to patch servers? And do I have to learn 
you know, scripting and all that stuff. So as sort of a jack of all trades, what above and beyond just networking would you ultimately hope that someone who works in your department knows how to do? I think it's pretty common for like a, a medium to small company to expect like someone, they're not going to just hire a network admin and you're only going to be expected to work on networking. You're also going to be managing, you know, probably a server environment. Um, more than likely there's going to be like a, an active directory domain controller. So I'm going to want you to have at least some familiarity with setting up like group policies and managing servers. Um, we deploy a lot of Linux servers. It's great because Linux is open source and anyone can go out there and build their own Linux server and play around with it. But I'm gonna want you to have some idea of deploying and managing Linux servers. Um, you know, it, I even want you to know like the basics on like, how does our copier work? You know what I mean? Because I can guarantee you someone's gonna come to you that if you work in tech, they're gonna be like, hey, the copier's broken. Can you fix that for me? And in those small organizations where you have like a team of one or two, you're gonna to have to learn how to deal with those things. And um, that's just gonna be a part of the job. My biggest advice to anyone is just be driven to be the best at whatever, you know, everything. And, um, you know, just have that drive and figure out how everything works. To be that go-to person. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's that's why I wanted to know. Absolutely. I'm curious. Do you have any resources or recommendations on how to stay current on like the evolving changes that are happening? What do you use to, you know, keep up to date with the industry changes that are happening? I'll be honest. I'm probably not the best person to ask when it comes to that, because even keeping up with adding new quizzes, adding new labs, adding an update video for the, the current stuff I teach at the CCNA and CCNP level, I honestly don't have that much time to keep up on the latest trends and things like that. I know that there are several websites out there like, um, uh, what is it? I get this one email, it says like SDX or something. It's, it's like software defined. It's a website about software defined things like software defined access, software defined WANs, that you can keep up on that. There's a uh, network world. Uh, which I think has a website, has a lot of stuff that's coming out. So I would typically look at things like that. That is great advice. As we mentioned in the very beginning of this video, we're actually going to be giving away five one-year annual premium memberships to the IE platform. If you guys are interested in entering this giveaway, there's going to be a link down in the description and you'll need the keyword IE to enter the giveaway. And that that is so cool. Um, you know, every year I've done this holiday giveaway where I try to give back to the community and help people learn and advance their skills. And I and E has always been there from day one, uh, supporting this. And um, I just love the I and E platform. Most online platforms, you know, you kind of sign up and they give you access, and that's it. You're like, here you go. You know, here's access. But I and E is just it's more advanced and more evolved than a lot of other online learning platforms, you know, where you just, you don't just have the videos, you have the, the quizzes, you have the, the virtualized labs. And, um, I really like how I &E has built out their lab environment. It seems very intuitive and quite fun to use. One of the things that I, I really like about our labs and, you know, for the first five years or so of working at i &E, the only labs we had were our rack rentals, where you actually had to rent time on physical gear, which was sort of problematic in a variety of ways. But I really like the last two, three years, the lab environment we have now. And one thing I think is awesome about it is, you know, let's say you're taking a course about something, uh, I don't know, let's say multicast PIM, you're learning about the protocol independent multicast. And there's, there's some lab in there, you start the lab, and it's got a pre-built topology of, you know, six routers or something interconnected, everything's addressed. And then the lab will say, okay, here's your objective. Here's your task. Make this, 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 and this happen. And so you log on, uh, and it's not a, a simulation. It's, it's full-fledged iOS, so you're not limited in your commands. You're not limited in what debugs and show things are available to you. It's, it's all there. So you go through it, and then there's going to be some sort of solution. Either it's going to be a text-based solution, or sometimes in some of our labs, it's a video-based solution. But what I think is awesome is our labs are, are fully open, meaning... You know, maybe while you were, the video you were watching just prior to that covered some stuff about multicast and PIM that wasn't actually in your task. You say, you know what? I'd like to practice that too. That sounds sort of interesting. Or I'd like to try break this multicast environment and see what syslog messages I get or <laughs> see what shows up on the debugs. You can go right into the lab and you can do that. You can 
pull in additional nodes to increase or decrease the size of your topology. You can wipe out the configurations that were previously there and put in your own configurations. You could wipe out everything, just build your own configuration from scratch like a sandbox environment. So unlike some people's labs where it's fixed, you can't change it and it's just, it is what it is. Ours are very flexible and I love that about our labs. I've seen that recent evolution in your guys' lab environment. I was actually studying for a um, cybersecurity certification with INE, and it was so amazing how immersive the labs are. I mean, it, it felt as about as close as you can get to a real world environment. And I was able to practice things that even if I set up my own home lab, I wouldn't have been able to do, you know, I'd had to invest like tons of money into actual equipment. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, they're, they're, they're great. I love them. I mean, if I wasn't an, an employee of INE, I would absolutely have an INE subscription to learn what I need to learn. Yeah. So as we land the plane, what is one thing, if you could go back in time, what is one thing you would do differently in your career progression, knowing what you know now? I would learn something that I still don't know how to do um, because I procrastinate and <laughs> it's hard. I would have learned scripting. I would have learned Python. I, I wish that many, many years ago, um, I had learned Python in my career development, um, especially now that AI is taking off, that uh, automation is taking off. You see Python co coming up over and over and over again. And, um, you know, I've tried and stopped, tried and stopped. I can't even count how many times because scripting is just not my bag. But I, I wish I had learned how to do that years ago, in addition to the networking stuff I learned. To be honest with you, I've never taken the time to actually learn scripting very well, um, short short of like some basic bash scripting in Linux. Um, that is definitely one thing I wish I spent more time on. I think the main reason I never really learned more is because none of the jobs I ever had used it. A lot of times, you know, we study for certifications. It's not for the job we have, it's for that next job we desire. And same with some of the skills you, you want to learn. But also, it it's, makes it a lot easier to stay motivated if that's something you can use on a day-to-day -day basis. Because, you know, I'll find myself, I'll go try to invest in time and in learning something, and then I won't touch it again, and I'll start forgetting it. Um, so it's hard to stay motivated sometimes. But if that interest piques you, it's a lot more easy to stay motivated and actually learn that skill I find. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've started and stopped with my learning of Python so many times, because it's like learning a foreign language where you have in your head, very much. Oh, I think it'd be really great to create a poem in Spanish. I would just love <laughs> to do that. That's my end goal. But first you got to slog through all the basics of verbs and nouns and permutations. And it's really hard to get through all of that to where you learn Spanish well enough that you can actually make something meaningful out of it. Um, and so that's that's been my problem as well with, with scripting is it's just it seems to take forever before I can actually get to the point where I can do what I would want to do with it. That's a really good way to look at it. I've never thought about it that way. Um... But that, that is so true. It, it takes a lot of effort. And if you're dedicated and you, you know, you're go drive through it and persevere, you're going to be way better off for it. And you're going to have so many more job opportunities that come up just career wise. It's going to be really great to have a skill to have, um, so. but it takes a lot of front end work to be able to get there, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that is so true. Well, I really appreciate you taking on, uh, taking the time to come on the channel and share uh, so much great advice with us. If people are interested in connecting with you or finding out more about INE, where can they go? Oh, well, they can certainly just go to INE.com or my.INE.com to learn more about INE. On YouTube, um, some of my videos I created for INE are on YouTube, so you can go to INE's channel and, and find them there. Uh, if they want to connect with me, they can always find me either via Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, or they can send an email to my email address at INE, which is just kbogart at INE.com. So I respond to all of those. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for taking the time to uh, share such great advice with us. And I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And until next time, keep learning.